Um, but the other side of the coin is, how do you get an A on a science test? What is it that actually gets you there? It's problems, problems, problems. And we're going to do a number of them tonight, but my goal is to lay a really good foundation. That way, you can go home between now and Monday and work a ton of problems. So, and I'll give you all the tools you need to work those problems. But if I give you all the tools to work problems, in between now and Monday you don't work problems, guess what's going to happen on Monday? I don't know if it's fail, but it's not going to be an A. <laughs> so problems are the key. If you want to master chemistry, and I highly recommend you shoot for mastery, so you need to work problems. And you can do it working problems without ever watching one of my review sessions. So, but hopefully this makes working problems a lot easier. So that's kind of the goal here. Uh, chapter four, all about solutions. So a solution has two parts. What do we call those parts? Solvent and solute. What's the solvent? So yeah, it's what's dissolved, everything's dissolved into. So, and it's a liquid, typically. There are exceptions to that that we will never talk about in this class. So, but your solvent, therefore, is then going to be a liquid. But your solute, what can you dissolve in a liquid? What kind of phases do we see for solutes? Well, when it's dissolved in water, we call it aqueous. But if it's dissolved in like alcohol or something, we wouldn't call it aqueous in that case. But, but what kind of phases, solid, liquid, or gas, can we dissolve in a liquid? So we can do liquids. In fact, we can do all three. So I can dissolve alcohol in water. So if you look at a typical beer, which might have like 5% alcohol, most of the other 95% is water. So you have two liquids dissolved in each other. Whichever one is you know, in a greater presence is the solvent. The other one in lesser presence is the solute. Uh, but we can also dissolve like salt or sugar in water. So that's solid solutes. We can also dissolve gases in water. So what do fish breathe? Oxygen. They breathe O2 oxygen. And that O2 has to dissolve into the water, which is why if you don't change out your fish's water, they might die. At least that's one of the reasons, because if they don't get more oxygen, so bubbling in there, what might want put a bubbler in there and stuff like that. So solvent is a liquid. Solutes can be solid, liquid, or gas. So is water electrically conductive? Good. In pure form, it is not conductive of electricity. However, if you dissolve certain solutes in it, you can make it electrically conductive. Now, sugar, if I dissolve that in water, the, the solution is not electrically conductive. But if I dissolve salt in the water, NaCl, table salt, it will be electrically conductive. So we call NaCl, therefore, an electrolyte. Whereas sugar, on the other hand, sucrose, is not an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. So electrolytes come in a couple of different varieties. So the first we call strong. The second we call weak. And then finally, with things like sugar, which I'll put three here, as non-electrolytes. So it's definitely not a class of electrolytes, the exact opposite. So, but that's where we saw like sugar. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. So your strong electrolytes, usually going to be one of three things. And these are kind of highlighted on your handout there with bullet points. So in the first are soluble ionic compounds. How do you know if an ionic compound is soluble? It's first of all, how do you know if you have an ionic compound, period? Metal and a non-metal or something involving like the polyatomic ions like nitrate, sulfate, so on and so forth. Okay. How do you know if it's soluble though? And what do we mean when we say that it's soluble? So yeah, it, when it dissolves, it dissociates into ions in water. And that's the key for an electrolyte. We need something that dissociates into ions. Sugar dissolves in water, but it doesn't dissolve and dissociate into ions. And that's why it doesn't conduct electricity. It's this property of being able to dissociate into ions that makes it electroconductive. So a soluble ionic compound dissociates into ions completely when you put it in water. OK. So how do I know if it's soluble, though? There's a bunch of rules. And do you have to memorize these rules? You don't. So are you going to potentially need these rules on the test? Yes. Yeah, so if you don't need to memorize them, but you're going to need them, what's the deal? Yeah, you have to know how to use the table, but the table is going to be given to you. So you guys are lucky. Some professors make their students memorize all those rules for this exam. You guys lucked out. But you do have to know how to apply them and figure out if a compound is either soluble or insoluble. So one thing to note, soluble and insoluble are not absolute terms. When we say something is soluble, we mean it dissociates into ions completely in water, sort of. When we say something is insoluble, we mean it doesn't dissociate in ions in water, sort of. But there's no 100% either direction. There's nothing that's 100% soluble. There's nothing that's 100% insoluble. Everything will always dissolve to a small extent. 
It's just when it's a very small extent, we call it insoluble. There's nothing that'll just keep dissolving. You can pour salt in water and pour salt in water and pour salt in water, and eventually you'll get to a point where you'll just have some solid salt sitting on the bottom of your beaker. You will reach a point of saturation. So just one thing to note on the distinction between soluble and insoluble. Soluble means things that dissociate to a great extent. Insoluble, things that don't dissociate hardly at all. All right, your other strong electrolytes are your strong acids and your strong bases. How many strong acids are there that you have to be aware of? Seven. Seven. And you need to memorize them. They're on your hand out there. So you got HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, HClO4, HClO3. They're all written on your handout already. So they are strong acids. How do I know they're acids to begin with? Yeah, they begin with an H. Most of the acids you will ever learn about begin with an H. There are exceptions to that, but none we have to worry about today. So all your strong acids begin with an H, and there's seven specific ones. So what if you see a compound that starts with an H? That's not one of your seven strong acids. What is it? It's a weak acid, it turns out as well. One of your weak electrolytes. So you've got seven strong acids. If you see any other acid, it has to be weak because it's not strong. So, but you need to memorize these. There's no way around it. We're going to make you rememorize them back when you take 116 later on this year as well. They're really important. Memorize them now because we're going to force you to again next semester anyways. Cool. So strong acids associate completely in water. Strong bases do the same thing. What's the most famous strong base? But which one specifically? Uh, not NH3. He's actually a weak base which we'll throw right in here with the other weak electrolytes. So it's actually sodium hydroxide, NaOH, kind of your classic, you know, doing a titration in high school kind of base, NaOH. But it's not just NaOH, it's any of the group one metal hydroxides, LiOH, NaOH, KOH, RBOH, CSOH. We won't talk about francium hydroxide because they've never really had a whole lot around and it's got a half-life of like 20 minutes and so don't worry about it. Uh, your group two metal hydroxides as well. Magnesium is not the most soluble, and truth be told, MCaOH2 is also not the most soluble, but up to its solubility limit, it's a strong base. Strontium hydroxide, SrOH2, and then BaOH2. So your group one, and then most of your group two metal hydroxides, those are your strong bases. Anybody else with OH, not a strong base. So if I have like silver hydroxide, AgOH, not a strong base. It's a weak one. Cool. So now we know our strong acids, strong bases, they are strong electrolytes. So your weak electrolytes, the most important ones are the weak acids and weak bases. Technically, things that are only partially soluble, as far as ionic compounds go, could fall in here as well, but you're much more likely to see weak acids or weak bases. And again, how do I know if an acid is weak acid? Uh, any acid that's not strong. So any acid that's not one of the seven. And then your weak bases, the most famous weak base you pointed out, Colleen, is NH3. So, but technically we can throw some other ones in there. And oftentimes the most common ones we'll throw in there are compounds related to NH3. In organic chemistry, we call them amines. And there's another example. So here's ammonia, but if you replace one of the hydrogens on the nitrogen with some sort of carbon chain, we call that an amine. Those are also weak bases. So either ammonia or am uh, amine or ammonia related compounds, those are your weak bases. There are other ones that you're not gonna worry about now that we'll teach you next semester as well. Finally, your non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes might dissolve in water, but when they do dissolve, they don't dissociate into ions at all. And these are typically molecular compounds, not ionic compounds. So one famous molecular compound is glucose. So glucose, how do I know this is a molecular compound? All nonmetals, all nonmetals. Most molecular compounds, all nonmetals, are non-electrolytes. There are a, a very small number that are actually weak electrolytes. So, but like this guy here, for instance. So, but most of them, besides the acids, bases, or weak acids, weak bases, all the rest are going to be non-electrolytes. So, another good example. It's already on your handout as well. Will be methanol. All nonmetals, non-electrolyte. It's not an acid or base. It is a non-electrolyte.